Buy your stat 66111 Skills for the rest of your life Bootstraps and probability It's the bread and butter, baby, what's your jam? It's time to discuss a little more bit about the bread and butter and jam of statistics with its history with Fisher's p-value, or what we now would more commonly think of and use as permutation tests. We'll first do a brief introduction of the general concepts involved and who Fisher was. We'll then discuss the idea behind Fisher's p-value, or again, what we call permutation tests, show an example, and close with a brief summary. So, Fisher's p-value is one of the tools used in data testing procedures. Now, it gets a little nuanced, but Fisher proposed tests of significance. This is in contrast to his rivals, Neyman and Pearson, who used tests of hypotheses. So in 1925, Fisher developed this framework that we're going to see in this lecture set known as tests of significance. And in another lecture set, we'll discuss the 1928 development of Neyman and Pearson for the, their framework based on testing actual statistical hypotheses. Now, interestingly, we don't really call either of those out on their own nowadays because these tests of significance were combined with the tests of hypotheses to what we now know as Null Hypothesis Significance Testing, or NHST. This was developed in 1940 and was a mashing together of these two concepts which Fisher, nor Neyman, or Pearson meant to be combined. However, we widely use this today and it still has a little bit of controversy um, based on its interpretations and how we most commonly may miss some of the nuance. Now, Ronald Fisher, or Sir Ronald Fisher, was born in 1890 and was a British statistician, geneticist, eugenicist, and professor. He arguably created many of the foundations we use for modern statistics and statistical theory. However, it is important to note that he had strong views on race and insisted there were racial differences for most of his life. In fact, he wrote testimony on behalf of Nazi eugenicists, writing that he believed the Nazi party wished to benefit the German racial stock, especially by elimination of manifest defectives, and that he would support such a movement. Now, it's important to note as well, he did evolve over his life and his opinions and thoughts on the appropriateness of such extreme actions did change, but it is also meaningful to note what he believed and the damage and harm it caused. As I noted before as well, he had a fierce rivalry with Pearson, um, the lady tasting tea, Salzburg, and all of these ideas it can be attributed to Fisher. So let's discuss Fisher's p-value, or this idea of permutation tests. Fisher's p-value is based on the idea of permutation tests, also what we might call an exact test, a randomization test, or a re-randomization test. So there's a lot of names that this may go by out in the wild when you encounter it. The general idea, though, is to obtain the distribution of a test statistic under the null hypothesis, or assuming that null distribution, by calculating all possible values of the test statistic under all the possible rearrangements or permutations of your data. Now, we'll revisit this idea of permutation tests in greater detail later as well, but we'll see how they handle it here for Fisher's p-value. There is a general framework we can use in determining Fisher's p-value, and again, we'll see this actually work through in an example. But the general steps we can follow is that we first collect some random sample, which we're denoting here as x1 um, up to xn. From this observed sample, we can calculate a test statistic, which we might call t obs, from those observed uh, random sample that we collected. For example, maybe it's the sample mean. Now we can, in step three, calculate the theoretical test statistics for every possible outcome or every permutation of the data, where we shuffle all the data up for i equals 1 up to n possible permutations. This set of the t theoretical is the exact distribution of all possible outcomes under the null hypothesis when we assume that there was no statistical association actually observed in the data. And if the null is true, then we would expect that shuffling up the data wouldn't actually really change our results. Um, any outcome could be equally likely to occur. 
in the case of calculating a one-sided p-value with Fisher's uh, permutation test, we see here that we could calculate, for example, the probability that our observed value is less than or equal to that theoretical distribution or permuted distribution we create. In other words, we can count the number of times that, that is true divided by the total number of permutations. For a two-sided p-value, we can do a very similar approach, but we'll just add these absolute value signs around our observed and theoretical distribution. So let's actually walk through a brief example of what this looks like, because honestly, those steps can be a little confusing and opaque just on one slide. Now we're going to borrow a problem from the Chihara and Hesterberg textbook in section 3.3. And it's nice because they look at it in this context of a permutation test, and it's a very small study. Now the outcome here is going to be the number of seconds or time it takes a mouse to complete a maze puzzle. And in group one, we're going to assume the mice are given some experimental drug, and in group two, they're given a placebo. And so maybe we expect there to be a difference in their times. And we see the times for each group in the table here, where they do appear to be potentially longer in the experimental group, but one mouse is 20 seconds, and we do have a 21 and 22 in the control. So let's take a look at how we can start leveraging R to also help us do these calculations. We can create vectors here of our information from the previous slide, where we have the experimental and control groups. We do see that if we calculate the mean time it took for the three mice, it's 25 seconds in the experimental group and 20.3 in the control group. So obviously those numbers are different. The experimental group with the drug took longer, but we might then really want to know, is this actually a meaningful difference? Or at least statistically, if we're trying to compare these values, do we have some evidence mathematically to suggest that that's meaningful? Even if clinically or practically speaking, we might look at those numbers and say it is or isn't meaningful on a sort of practical significance uh, conclusion. So again, returning to Fisher's idea of how we answer that question of, is this meaningful? Well, in this case, with six observations, three in each group, there are 20 possible random permutations of the data. Or in other words, 20 different ways we could choose three mice from the six when the order doesn't matter. In other words, just putting three mice within each of the groups. These random shufflings then will represent all possible groupings of the mice, sort of assuming, well, what if this mouse had the exact same time if it happened to have been in the other group that it wasn't assigned? In other words, there's no effect of the treatment. Again, if there's no association between time to complete the maze and the drug, we would expect the shuffling is equally likely to occur um, regardless of what group the mice are in. Now, it can take a bit of work to actually write out all these permutations, even for just these 20, and so we're going to borrow table 3.1 from the textbook as well to illustrate all these combinations. And we can see here is we have the permutations in these first three columns for those in the experimental drug group, and in the second column, or second set, I should say, of three columns, the control group times that are permuted across all these different combinations. We then see that we have the calculated sample mean for the drug and the control, as well as the difference between the two groups in all of these permutations. I've added this little section here to highlight our observed results in the table, where we see that we had a 4.67 difference uh, between the two groups with the drug group taking longer. Now what we can see with Fisher's approach, the way we would calculate all of these observed test statistics here, this distribution in this far right column is our null distribution or the permutation distribution of our statistic. We can see here then that for a one-sided test, we can calculate, well, how often do we see something as or more extreme than what we observed? And so obviously the test statistic we observed is as or more extreme because it is the test statistic. But then we see that in this entire 20 combinations, there's only two other cases of shuffling the data where we actually wind up with a difference in means that is greater than what we observed or the same size. So among those 20 permutations of data, we have those three that have a difference in means as large or larger than 4.67. So with our calculation, we would take three divided by 20 and say we have a p-value of 0.15. Now the nice thing about Fisher's p-value is it's a bit more intuitive to interpret because we're making this assumption that by shuffling everything up, we have this permutation null distribution. 
So in other words, if there's no association between drug and speed you complete the maze, then purely by chance we would see a difference as or more extreme than what we observed 15% of the time. So really, if we're kind of going back to what we might have seen already in practice, a p-value of less than 0.05 being arbitrarily considered significant, we would conclude that it's actually not that unlikely for the observed data to have occurred if there truly is no difference between the groups. Now, just briefly we should note here, this is the idea of statistical significance that we're discussing. This is not necessarily equal to what we might call practical or clinical significance. So it is still possible that a difference of almost five seconds is meaningful clinically or practically speaking. However, we lack the statistical power, which we'll discuss later in the semester, to detect that difference. So in summary, Fisher's p-value is a key building block to how we actually conduct all modern day null hypothesis significant testing, whether Fisher meant for it to be or not in the way it's currently implemented. Fisher's p-value itself is actually based on this idea of permutation tests. And so we'll see this again later in the semester in more detail when we cover and discuss nonparametric tests and related but quite different concepts like bootstrapping. The big though idea to take away here is that Fisher proposed that we generate this null or again permutation distribution, some call it from the data, and use that to determine our significance or potential significance thereof. So with that, we will conclude this lecture and discuss the Neyman-Pearson approach and the trade-offs in the next one.